Ok. Uh, hola. Es un placer estar aquí. Voy a hablar en español. Ah, no, it was only a joke, but I, it's really nice to be in uh, Madrid, and I really like Spain and, and Spanish culture, so it's nice to be here. So hi, today I'm going to talk about how we can get data from Kafka to Parquet. So first, to give you a little bit of context, I work at Ball.com, and Ball.com is the biggest e-commerce platform in the Netherlands and Belgium. So we're a huge web shop that sells everything from toys, books, electronics, and now, lately, we even started selling alcoholic beverages, which is kind of awesome. Uh, so, and then a little bit about me. I'm Gabor. I work as a data engineer at Ball.com. And previously, uh, I've worked at, in a research institute in Hungary, and I was mostly involved with contributing to open source projects like Apache Fling streaming, and I also implemented some machine learning algorithms on top of these distributed systems. So and now I'm work at work, I've been working at a measuring team and recommendations teams at Ball.com. So today I'm going to talk about a really simple problem, or at least a seemingly simple problem, to have a data stream and turn this stream into files, just like files based on time. And although this seems easy, we struggled with it a lot, and uh, we tried several solutions, and I hope we learned a lot from this struggle, and I hope you're also going to learn a little bit. So I'm just going to go through our solutions and then conclude. So what is this problem exactly? So first, we have uh, click data, so basically events about users viewing some products, clicking on recommendations, all sorts of things. And we store this data in Kafka, and I think you, uh, you probably know Kafka. How many of you know Kafka? OK, yeah, yeah, sure, I'm at the right place. So it's a distributed message queue, simply. And uh, we store that data there because we can get, get uh, that data in real time. And of course, we need a distributed message queue because we have a huge amount of data. Currently, we have around 10,000 events per second in in this specific uh, topic, and, and it's going to increase because our company is going to grow and we're going to measure more and more. So uh, then the challenge is putting that data into files uh, on HDFS, on Hadoop Distributed File System specifically. And why do we need this? We need it because, like, yeah, everybody's going streaming nowadays, but we still have analytics teams that you, that are using tools that cannot read Kafka, or if you just want to gain insights from really historical data one year ago, uh, plain old files uh, can work easier for you. So basically our task is, how are we going to do that? How are we going to get from Kafka to HDFS files? So uh, before I go into that, I want to touch one topic, which is the, the difference between batch and stream processing. So I guess probably you mostly have an idea about it. Batch processing is you, when you have like a finite amount of data and you have a program that gets this data, outputs a result, and that's it, the pro program is finished. Maybe you run it daily, but it's just plain simple finished. In stream processing, you have a continuous data stream, an infinite data stream, you process the data 24-7, your job is running 24-7, and you're con continuously creating output. But to give you an analogy, I like this analogy, let's say you have a problem, you want to fill a pool with water. So batch processing is a bit like having buckets and carrying buckets of water around and filling it into the pool. So it seems like, ah, like, uh, yeah, terrible job. And stream processing is like when you have a water hose and you just hold a water hose and you can fill the pool. So actually, in this analogy, like the water is your data. And you can see, see that like batch processing, batches, batches are the buckets basically. But uh, where does it get to in our problem? So in our case, we have a stream of data in Kafka. We have that water hose. We have that stream. And we want to fill up buckets, basically. We want to, want to create some batch files so that people can use it in batch processing as well. So in expectation, it should be easy. In reality, we can go crazy with that water hose like that dog. And we actually went a little bit crazy with this. So, but why? Why is, it, why is it difficult? It's just dumping data, right? So it's difficult because we have some requirements. First, we want a scalable solution, and it's not surprising. We are at a big data conference, 
like I told you, we have we have a uh, we have a thousand uh, events per second. It's growing. We want something scalable. Second, we also want to, to dump the data exactly once. And what do I mean by that? So we have one message in Kafka, and we should, ha should have exactly those messages in the files. So I don't want to lose any messages in the files, and I don't want any duplicates. Why, don't, why, why, why do I care about duplicates? Because let's say there's a data analyst in our company, Katie, for example, and she will need to read this data several times. She doesn't want to start every single job by saying distinct. Katie doesn't like distinct. Katie, Katie, Katie wants deduplicated data. So we are thinking about our data co consumers and not, not ourselves. So exactly once is one requirement. Another requirement is event time. Uh, having these files in event time. And what do I mean by that? So let's say we are reading event stream and one, one event comes in at 9 a.m. A user clicked on something, but actually the user clicked on, on that item at 8.55. So the, so the time when the event happened and when we got to process the event is a little bit different. So the event is, is a little bit late. So where, where should we put that event then? Should we put it in, into the batch file of, let's say we have batches of one hour, batch files in one hour. Should we, should we put it uh, for 9, 9 a.m. or 8 a.m.? We want to put it at 8 a.m. Why? Because also from a data co uh, consumer perspective, Katie, our data analyst, she doesn't really want to care about like, yeah, if I need only the events from between 8 and 9, which files should I look at? She, she doesn't want to look at the neighboring times and files. She just wants, like, I want the events that happened between 8 and 9. So we need files in event time. And last but not least, we want the columnar format uh, because it's more optimized for reading. Again, Katie doesn't like loading uh, files uh, Take, that take a long time, so, so that's what we want. And to, to give you a little bit idea why uh, this columnar format is better, uh, let's say you have a data set like customer view, customers viewing products, so you have a customer ID, the product ID viewed, and you have a product category. And there are basically two ways to store this data on disk. One is the row-oriented format. So in this case, you store, store this data record by record. So first, you're going to store uh, all the fields for the first record, so the customer ID, the visitor ID, the, um, uh, the, the visited product, and the, the category in one record, and then for the second record, and then for the third record, and so on. Whereas in a column-oriented format, it's, yeah, it's pretty trivial, you store it by column. So first, you store the, all the customer IDs, then you store all the visited products, then you store all the categories. And, but yeah, that, that seems easy, but why is it, why this uh, row-oriented format is not so good for, for analytics for reading the data? Uh, let's say we have another data analyst, Peter, over there, and he doesn't like uh, slow loading, and Peter is not interested in the categories. Peter is only interested in two columns, uh, just, just, the, just the customer ID and the product visited. So in this case, if we store it in row-oriented format, uh, the system that Peter uses needs to read all the data anyway, because, because he's reading it by row by row, every row, so he needs, needs to read those books. And if you're talking about big data, this can be an issue. This can, be, this can make it a lot slower. So in contrast with the column-oriented format, because we stored it in columns and we're not interested in, or at least uh, Peter is not interested in the category, we can, we can just decide not to read that column, and it makes, it makes it basically faster. So both our data analysts, Katie and Peter, they do love, they do the fast loading, so we want a columnar format, and the go-to columnar format in, uh, in this Apache, Hadoop landscape, and file landscape is Parquet, so we, we went with Parquet. So let's get back to our requirements. So we, we, I talk, told, about, told you about the requirements, but uh, what system, what tool are we going to use to solve this problem? So, first thing that popped into our mind was Apache Flink, uh, and that's uh, also the, the distributed stream processing system. How many of you have heard about Apache Flink? Uh, okay, cool. Okay, so this is not going to be really new, but Apache Flink is really well suitable, for, or seems suitable for these requirements. Why? Because it's distributed, it's scalable, 
It, it uh, gives you exactly one guarantees, even if failure happens, it has obstructions for handling this event time, and it has parquet output connectors, input connectors. So that seems, uh, seems, uh, seems cool and easy. But so yeah, so actually in our problem, the question mark becomes, yeah, we're going to use Flink, Flink for that. But uh, we'll see how it goes. So first, let's go to our first solution. We first uh, wanted to use Flink windowing. And Flink windowing is basically, windows are just chunks of events uh, based on time. So you can have a window from 8 to 9 or 9 to 10 and so on. And what happens is that Flink will kind of store the data for one window, and then when the window finishes, it will do something, an aggregation. So in this example, I'm collecting events for, for two hours. Uh, for, uh, so let's say, again, let's say we, are, we want to write day, uh, hourly batch files, so batch files for every single hour. First, uh, uh, you can see that in the Kafka queue, I, I noted with, uh, with brown and, and uh, blue squares. So the, the blue squares are for events between 19 and, uh, and 20 o'clock, and the browns are events for 18 and 90. So you can see that the events are out of order, and that, that's also what happens in reality. You don't see your events come in order because you all have distributed systems. I also did a simplification here because I'm just showing one ordered queue. In reality, you have a distributed queue in Kafka. You have multiple partitions per topic, uh, but you can easily generalize my examples to multiple partitions. So yeah, so we start reading the data, and we collect this data uh, per windows in Flink. Uh, so we have a window for events between 18 and uh, 19 hour, and so on. And we just read this data, and as soon as we know that, that one window has finished, we've seen all the events before 19 o'clock, we're going to write that file. And Flink just keeps this data in memory. So that's look, that looks pretty straightforward and easy. But how do we handle failures? Oh, we're lucky in this case. Yeah, we can celebrate. It's out of the box. We don't really even need to care about fault tolerance. We don't need to understand it, because Flink will handle, handle it for us. If we are using these uh, windowing abstractions. But there's always a but. But we might use too much memory. Like I said, uh, this is also a bit of simplification, but Flink keeps this state, keeps these windows uh, in memory. And in our case, if we just assume that somebody decides we don't want batches for one hour, but we want it for two hours, and we're using the same amount of memory, we need to keep two hours of data in memory, so maybe we're like collecting, collecting it in memory, and boom, at one point it's going to run out of memory. So we could just increase the memory in the machines, add more processing units, and so on. But it feels a little bit bad, because we want to do a simple thing. We just want to read some data and dump it into files. Why should I keep these files in memory? And so we actually experienced a lot of, like, like when the load changed, we experienced these out-of-memory exceptions, and uh, we decided, like, it, it's, it's better to come up with a solution that doesn't require that much memory. So we went on to the next solution, which is called the bucketing sync. And in Flink, Flink uh, the, basically, the output connectors are called sync. We are syncing the data, so you could have a sync for Cassandra, a sync for for, uh, I don't know, Kafka as well, or any other database. And the bucketing sync is basically something that uh, uh, writes into files called buckets, and buckets are also files based on time. So this seems exactly what we need. We want buckets of time for every single hour. And yeah, that, that, that should work well. So, so in these images you see, now we are still reading the data from Kafka, and we are dumping it into files, but we don't need to store it in memory. As soon as we read the record for, 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 some, for some bucket, for, for like an event between 19 and 20 uh, o'clock, uh, we, we will just dump it into the file. So basically nothing is stored, or minimal things are stored in memory. So that sounds good. But what about handling failures? And here comes a little bit more tricky part. 
and we need to understand Flink uh, fault tolerance mechanism a little bit. So Flink handles failures by, by making checkpoints. And how does it make checkpoints? It actually marks one point in the data source uh, when a checkpoint happens, and I noted that with that green line, as you can see. And when the data processing reaching, reaches that checkpoint, Flink will mark uh, the part of the files, the point in the position in the files that has been written until the checkpoint. So we will, oh, I also marked it with small uh, green lines at the files. So the checkpoint goes and we keep on processing, we're writing more data to the files, and boom, suddenly a failure happens. Yeah, and failure, failures can happen. Like for example, in our case, we had a commodity Hadoop cluster and people were like uh, sometimes maintaining node and if somebody picks the node your job was running on, then your job's gonna fail. So that's, it's that easy. So you need to account for failures. So in a failure scenario, what Fink does, it rolls back the reading to the checkpoint and because we marked or because Flink marked the, the position of the file when the checkpoint happened, uh, it can just simply cut off the end of the file. It can just truncate the file and keep on writing the data. So this is, this is the, the big idea uh, that, that ensures exactly one's guarantees. If we kept the file, kept, kept the, the data at the end of the files, we would have duplicates. But by, by knowing exactly the position of the files at the checkpoint, we can just uh, truncate them. So that sounds good, and it should work well, but there's always a but. Uh, in our case, HDFS doesn't support truncating. So it doesn't support cutting the end of the files. So we just cannot do that. And, and that's kind of sad, but when we were doing it, it, it was a problem. The good thing is that the Flink community has already fixed it, and it can actually support systems that don't allow truncating, that doesn't support truncating by just copying the relevant parts of the files. So we know until which position it's still uh, correct data and it can copy that data. But there's another but. Parquet doesn't allow flushing. So that means at the checkpoint, we cannot know the position uh, what we were writing. We cannot, we cannot, cannot uh, know that simply. So that leads to problem. We just cannot, cannot know what was the position when our checkpoint ended. So at a failure, we don't know what parts to cut in our files. So that led uh, us to another idea. Uh, that means closing files at checkpoints. And what do I mean by that? So uh, we don't just write one file per every hour. We, we keep files in a directory per every hour. And we're going to write multiple part files. And first, uh, we're going to write one part file. But when we get to the checkpoint, we just close the file that we've been writing and start a new file. Uh, and as the writing goes on, we, we're only gon going to write to the new file. And when a failure happens, we can simply remove that old file and roll back to the checkpoint. So actually, that helps us because we don't, we don't need truncating. We don't need to know the position. We just close the files at every checkpoint. So that kind of solves our problem, but there's always a but. Uh, we need, in order to do this, we needed to change Flink bucketing sync code, which is like kind of feels tricky. And I think that's, that's one really good point in open source projects, because when you're doing something and something doesn't work, but you could kind of use the code and change the code, it's pretty useful, and in the Apache project, the code quality is normally uh, really good. So what we did, we just looked at the bucketing sync code and just changed it to our to our needs to close uh, close these files. And then even better, uh, Flink is already supporting this closing files at checkpoints with this something called streaming file sync. So the community actually solved it uh, for us as well, but we. We've, we've been experimenting with this before the release of Flink 1.6, which, which got this feature. So it's a really huge kudos to, kudos to Flink community because, yeah, that's, that's awesome. We won't need to worry about this anymore. But we had another problem. We, like I said, we've been writing data, but we also cared about late events. So we actually had, like we said, like we want to keep late events if they are within 
12 hours late. Uh, so what happens in that case is that we are going to write the data and we're, we're writing those files, and at first there will be like large files and a small amount of files. Uh, but as we're moving to late events, we will have, uh, like, let's say we're writing a file for 9 o'clock uh, by, by, uh, by uh, seven o 9 o'clock in the morning. By 7 o'clock in the evening, it's still within 12 hours, but we're going to have a lot of, uh, we're not going to have a lot of events for, for 9 a.m. So we're not, maybe some files will only contain one record, one single record. And we will end up with a lot of, lot of small files, and that's bad for HDFS, because HDFS is not really good in handling small files, but not just to this specific HDFS technology. Uh, handling a lot of small files is not really good for processing system. For instance, in this case, some people wanted to process in the company, or process this data with Apache Pig, and Pig, first, before doing any processing, reads the data and reads the metadata about uh, the data sets to estimate the size of the data and so on to, to, to create optimizations. And it just couldn't handle too many files because so we got something uh, like, like a too many connections error or something like that. And that's, that's not really good because we cannot really support Katie and Peter, our data analysts, easily. So, and by this time, like, we, we've tried a lot of things, so we were like, why? Why can't this simple thing be done easily? Like, uh, we, why, is this, why is this streaming fault tolerance and all these systems, why are those so complicated? Why do we need to understand them? So actually, one uh, teammate of mine, uh, Karst, came up with, a, with an idea, like, why don't we just run a daily job that that or an hourly job that, that reads all the data in Kafka and dumps out the relevant things in an hour. That's pretty simple, right? So we did that, and that's basically we just uh, for let's let's say for the events between 18 and 19 hour, we just read the whole Kafka queue, dump dump the and only dump the events relevant to that hour, and then later we will run another job, and we only dump the events for for uh, the events between 19 and uh, 20 o'clock. So that's simple, of course, but uh, yeah. So I, I kind of feel like sometimes sticking to batch processing is like carrying those buckets can still be, still be, still be cool and we can still be happy about it because we avoid all the complexities. Of course, this is not a perfect solution because first, we need to reprocess the data. Every time we read the data, we need to process maybe the whole Kafka queue or we need to process an additional data anyway. So that's, that's not really, really perfect. And it also doesn't support the so-called semi-real-time case. And I call it semi-real-time because there are some analytics people who want to use data like not uh, everyday batches, but they want to get the, what happened in the last half hour. We're getting into the Christmas season with Black Friday coming next week. So gaining insights, what happened in the last half hour or last 10 minutes is really important. And maybe they cannot use Kafka for these cases. They still want to use files. And if we're going to run a daily bad job and run a bad job every day, then kind of the, our latency will be one day, and that's not acceptable for some use cases. So it's not for working for that. But of course, like for the reprocessing problem, we can use some optimizations for, for this batch processing. For instance, Kafka now supports indexing based on event time, which means you can kind of, Kafka keeps track of your, uh, of the position of every hour in the data, or you can set up which time, time range. So you don't need to read the whole Kafka queue to get the, the time uh, frame that you need. You can rely on this indexing and you only read the relevant parts. So that's it basically, that's, that's, that's what we did. But uh, I, of course I'm not satisfied with it uh, totally. So what, what, what would be a proper solution for the future? And the, we haven't done this, but actually one idea is like, we were aiming for plain simple files, and those are practically working well for a lot of scenarios, but what if we, instead of storing the batch data in files, we just use, use the database? And actually uh, the team is working on something like that because we're using Google Cloud for some, some stuff, and uh, 
they are working on getting this data into BigQuery, uh, which is Google's analytics uh, solution, instead of just plain files. You could, yeah, so that's one, one other solution. You could use different tools like, and, and, and of course that database like uh, BigQuery will take care of partitioning your database on time and you don't need to worry about it. And you can use another tool, not Apache Fling, but maybe Kafka Streams, or I'm sure that there are hundreds of solutions out there that might uh, solve this problem better. We went with Fling because we've, we've already used Fling and it seemed like a good idea. Another idea is because our last problem was like a lot of small files that Apache Pig and other systems, HDFS, cannot really handle. So you could just write the small files and merge them in the end. That's another solution. Or you can just, like I said, in the, we had small files because we, we were keeping up late events for 12 hours. You could just say that I don't care about those small number of late events. Let's just drop them and let's maybe only keep uh, late events that are five minutes late, but not 12 hours late. So these are all options, but um, to get back to a problem, uh, li like I said, one interesting problem is how do we support semi-real time? And there are different solutions for that, and everybody's talking about Kappa architecture and Lambda architecture nowadays. So, so by supporting uh, real, so Kappa architecture basically means you do everything in streaming. At, that sounds cool because you have one code base, you have one system that can handle both streaming and batch workloads and all these things. Whereas Lambda ar architecture means you have a batch system combined with a streaming system, and these are two separate systems. You maintain two code bases, and you specialize it to these two use cases. So in our example, how, how could we support real time? Maybe we could support re real time by doing the same batch uh, processing, uh, the reading the data and writing the data in, in daily batches, and then do create another job that simply, simply drops the late events. So that sounds good because first, we, we got to keep all these late events uh, in the historical data. So we, we, we got to keep exactly the same amount of events, but we can still support our real-time use cases and we can still, uh, still, still uh, satisfy our data analysts who wants events in the last few minutes, the uh, last half an hour. So actually, this was just one example uh, of this, this kind of Kafka architecture, Lambda architecture thing. And I think a lot of people are excited about Kafka architecture, and me included. But in some cases, uh, a Lambda architecture, like separating these two domains, can keep it simple, because these two things have uh, specialized solutions. So uh, the main takeaway I want to give you is that I think streaming is not trivial. So so we can think, we can, and other people can say that Kappa architecture is the way to go, but I think, uh, I think in a lot of cases there's a lot of complexity. In this case, the fault tolerance, and we needed to understand the fault tolerance system, which is, in a batch system, it would just be like, we just restart the job if it's a bad job. In streaming, it's completely uh, different, and it's more complex. So I would say streaming is not trivial, but I, I should be fair and that streaming is not trivial yet. And what is, what is awesome that I've seen talks uh, yesterday from, from, uh, from data artisans, Ayesha was talking about uh, uh, these, and, and Confluent is also here at the conference. I've heard a talk about Apache Pulsar. And these guys are all working on uh, something called the Kappa architecture, which is they are working on making it easy for us to just use Kappa architecture, use one code base, and use it for streaming and batch as well. And I think in the coming years, it's going to be more usable. But I would say for some use cases, it's not there yet. And it's, it's, it's just difficult, and it's a struggle. So I would say just keep it simple. And if you have a use case and you find like, oh, streaming would be awesome, but doing a batch processing is still feasible, then go for batch processing. Or if, but if you're adventurous and you see that, like, yeah, let's try streaming, go for streaming, but then understand the system. Because understanding Flink, fault tolerance, and understanding how these things work were really important for us to deal with the problems and understand what can go wrong. So in that case, try, try to understand uh, your system. 
better. So that's it, basically. I also wrote a blog post about this topic. Like, not everything is included, what I was talking here, but you can, you can check that out, and you can reach me on Twitter, and I'm ha happy to answer questions. So I saw some hands raised over there, but... Hi, really nice talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. I recently joined a project where, where we were doing this kind of moment, uh, moving data to, to park it. Uh, and the, the point that at some point, and it is, it's not the first time I have this discussion, we, we try to to decide we, uh, whether going to park it, whether going to Hive with optimized uh, row columnar format. Uh, I don't know if you guys have done any performance analysis regarding that. Uh, what are your concerns? And regarding the small files problem you've been facing, I, want, I just wanted to know if you have uh, consider to uh, apply somehow of uh, dynamic partition in, uh, you know, regrouping the, the uh, packets of time with less utilization to, to improve the, the performance. That's all. Yeah, so uh, I'm not sure what you mean by, by uh, so the dynamic partitioning, but to answer your first part of the question, uh, Yes, yeah, so parquet format is just one choice, and it's like every choice is a, uh, the trade-off, and I talked about our requirements, but you can kind of loosen those requirements up. So, for instance, you could just use uh, use Apache Avro or some any other format you want if you can still get out the performance for your analytics teams. So, maybe using a simpler format and not a, like a row-oriented format could help uh, you because then you wouldn't have these problems with the uh, flushing and and all these things. So that's that's something. But uh, yeah, in in generally, I yeah. I don't know, it really depends on the use case, what, uh, what you can do. Yeah. Oh, here's, here's one. Yes, so so that's that's one other thing. Uh, uh, we do transformations, especially in in the age of GDPR. Uh, we need to anonymize some parts of our data sets, and and that's one of the things why we need a like also distributed processing system and not just a simple solution like dumping the data really really directly, because then we can we can also do arbitrary transformations on these records. So, yeah. Okay, I don't see any more hands, but uh, I will be staying here for a while, so you can catch me for questions if you want afterwards. Thanks, thanks everybody.